What is the purpose of checkpointing in Spark? Uh, purpose of checkpointing. So checkpointing is actually a feature that allows in the Spark that uh, that Spark allowed you to store the intermediary data in uh, any of the persistent locations like HDFS, ST, and anything. So actually, the purpose of this one is to uh, handle the fault tolerance. Like if anything were uh, failed in the Spark job. And uh, visually, Spark job will work in the LazyD evaluated model. And uh, whenever any action will trigger, then only Spark will go to the real sources and read the data and will apply the transformations uh, one by one. So this will actually track the lenience. So Spark will execute everything on the lenience uh, mode. Uh, like if you if you wouldn't enable the checkpointing, every time when you trigger an action, it will uh, go to the source location, start reading the data and doing all the transformations from uh, step one onwards. So this actually uh, takes a lot of time. So to override that one, we can use the checkpointings. So checkpointing so whenever any action will trigger if you add the checkpointing uh, location in the code so it will write the uh, checkpointing the pers- the present state of the files into some persistent uh, storage and then uh, whenever uh, another action will be triggered the the files will uh, you know if the second uh, if any further actions will be triggered the data will be read from the checkpointing locations and the data will be executed. So mostly these checkpointing will be used in the Spark streaming applications that we see very often because uh, the Spark streaming applications will execute in the micro batches. So uh, for every uh, micro jo- or micro batch execution, it will write the data to the checkpointing location. So that's how even if at any case, if the Spark job fails, the streaming job can continue its execution from where it left off. So this is how the checkpointing uh, will help to override the fault tolerance in the Spark. What will happen if your Spark job fails at 50% completion? So uh, after 50% completion of the execution, uh, since uh, Spark can read the data or it can uh, uh, execute the transformation, so during the execution of the transformation, if Spark job fails, uh, it do not write any data to the target locations, or uh, uh, it do not uh, you know do any kind of, uh, you know, persisted uh, action so uh, it's a kind of a job failure uh, so to reload the data we need to rerun the job so when you rerun the job it will start executing from the step one onwards so to override this issue we can add the checkpointing locations suppose if we have a very long running bad jobs or a streaming jobs so for this we can add the checkpointing location so the help of the checkpointing location is after it com- uh, a complete execution like 30%, 30% or even 50%, if you add the checkpointing location, when you rerun the job, it do not run from the step one. Instead, it will rerun the uh, job from the uh, from there it left off in the previous execution. Can you explain the concept of dynamic partitioning? Yeah, uh, dynamic partition is a kind of a concept also available in the SPA. Like it will adjust the partitions inside inside the Spark dynamically based on the data size, based on the uh, partitions and the based on the requirements. So this is the intelligence mechanism was built in the Spark. Uh, Spark can itself automatically adjust the number of the partitions, especially in the Spark 3 onwards. This feature works like charm. Uh, you don't need to uh, give the number of the partitions. So you need to specify the number of the partitions during the exhibition of the spawn job. So this feature definitely helps uh, when you are uh, when you are running data stream APIs or SQLs, especially when you are using the group bias uh, bias or SQL join operations. Uh, this feature is quite uh, handy. How does adaptive query execution (AQE) function in Spark? AQE. Adaptive Query Execution. So this feature was available in Spark 3, uh, version 3 onwards. So the purpose of this is to improve the parallelism, to improve the performance, and to make sure it is uh, make sure the Spark job utilize the maximum utilization of the cluster resources. So what it does is like when you enable this one, so it offers different uh, functionality. Like you know, uh, it will enforce the joins if, if it all uses in a join. It enforces the join to use the broadcast join if it applicable. Uh, if there is any small data set is trying to join with a large data set, it will automatically convert the join to uh, broadcast join instead of start met join. So this will actually improve the performance. The second thing is automatic selection of the dynamic partitions. Like when you apply any sort of the wider transformation like join group by 
are aggregated by kind of an operations. So it will enforce to use the specific number of the partitions to use it. And it will try to reduce the number of the partitions using the Colliers method so that uh, the developer need not to worry about the number of partitions and all. Uh, that is also another advantage. The other thing is, so especially when you have a, a skewed data, uh, the skewed data will cause the out of memory actions and data spill uh, kind of issues. So this will actually, uh, you know, kills the job. So to override that one, the adaptive query execution comes with a different logic that it can, uh, you know, handle the skewed data partition at some level. What distinguishes it as a map reduce from Spark programming? So Spark programming is a, a kind of in-memory computation engine, whereas MapReduce mostly used for heavy, large batch, uh, large sized batch uh, uh, jobs. So MapReduce mostly execute in the map and uh, reduced phase. Even Spark also execute in the map and uh, reduced phase. But when it comes to medium to large kind of a data set, the Spark can excel because Spark can give you the 100x performance compared to the MapReduce because the MapReduce is mostly works in the distributed uh, model in the disk-based disk uh, shuffling. So, but uh, the Spark works in the in-memory kind of a model. So compared to disk, in-memory model was quite faster. Uh, that's the reason Spark can give you the better uh, performance when it comes to uh, large-based uh, executions. And also Spark can offer different uh, sets of the features like, you know, executing your job in the data frame APIs with the SQLs and uh, comes with many other uh, advantages like it can also support the ML and the graphics libraries and uh, machine learning libraries and also uh, can, uh, you know, come up with the decision programming languages that it can support. But MapReduce were lacking of all these features. It can support only one programming language in the Java and do not, it do not have any other uh, functionality to, you know, inbuild the ML and other uh, functionality. What is a serializer in the context of Spark? So a uh, serializer is a kind of a process uh, to move the data or a network. Like whenever any kind of a job uh, executes in the in memory, so it will construct the data structure and it will create the objects. So if you the objects are usually uh, you know uh, sizing bigger when compared to actual data. So to avoid uh, this one, actually we can use the serializer and deserializer uh, techniques. So serializer is a process of converting the object to a uh, byte oriented format that is very easy to transfer the data over a network. Uh, to the different executors or workers. So usually Spark works in a distributed kind of a model. So in the distributed kind of a, a model, we uh, have in a use cases like mostly we send the data over a network to the, to the driver or executor for, or loading the data from uh, one driver to one executor to another executor, especially during the shuffling operation. So serializer is the key concept, like if whenever you are dealing with a huge data uh, while inside this or not. Because if, you, if the serializer was not working in a good where uh, good so it takes uh, a lot of time to process out the data so spark support two days of uh, different uh, serializers one is like uh, java serializer that is a default uh, serializer that uh, that do not work in most of the use cases it do not fit it, it is uh, inefficient instead we can use a cairo serializer that is specially designed for the spark based applications to especially to for the serialization and deserialization process so serialization reduce the data size and also it's leading to uh, faster network transfers and optimized uh, performance in uh, distributed processing. What type of index have you implemented in a fact table? So, uh, in fact tables, uh, recently we'll implement the bitmap uh, indexes, especially for high cardinality column. So bitmap indexes are efficient for filtering and uh, aggregating large data sets, especially in uh, wall up scenarios. Uh, improving query performance uh, significantly uh, depends on the database and uh, query patterns. Uh, other index strategies also we can uh, imp uh, impose like uh, composite, RB3 indexes, or uh, you know other indexes that can actually benefit to improve the performance of the fact table. How to find the smallest number in a list using Python? Uh, in Python, using the smallest number in list of numbers. So uh, list actually comes with the uh, uh, inbuilt function, something like a minimum, like min function. So with the help of a min function, we can try to get the minimum element. Uh, that is about the very simple thing that we can achieve. If you want me to go with the brute force approach, I can use the for loop. So I can iterate every element 
and I can uh, take the first element as a minimum element and I can compare that minimum element with every other element in the list. So if I find anywhere that uh, 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 that the minimum element that is already available in the uh, temple location, I will swap with the minimum element. So like oh, I will uh, I will iterative and I can compare with each and every element in the list and I can find the uh, minimum element in the list. So that's how I can uh, write. So time complexity we can use for this big go of n. Even if you use the min function, the time complexity is the big go of n. What are the various read and write modes available in Spark? Uh, Spark comes with uh, different read and write modes. Uh, when it comes to the read modes, so we have a different uh, read modes are available, like to read different uh, types of uh, file formats, like uh, CSV, Parquet, JSON, and uh, many other file formats like ORC, and uh, uh, you know, for many other file format that can come, so even with the Spark latest version 3.5 onwards, it also supports the XML uh, file format. So that is about reading. When it comes to the writing, uh, writing also can support the different file formats along with reading to the databases, APIs, and other things. So uh, it can also come with the different file formats. Along with the modes, uh, the common modes are like, you know, uh, append mode. So if you use the append mode, the data will be appended to the existing uh, file. You do not delete any of the data. But if you use the overwrite as a kind of uh, another mode, in the override mode, it will uh, it will delete the existing data and it will write the data as freshly to the file system or to your table or, or to any other uh, targeted location. And we can have a ignore mode. So if any target in target system, when the target file system, the file is already available, it, it will ignore, it do not do anything over that. Okay. And we can also use the error mode. Like if the file is already existed in the location, it will throw in an error. Can you describe the ACI properties in a database? Yeah, ACID properties is nothing but uh, acid properties. Uh, acid properties, nothing but like, you know, A for atomicity, C for consistency, uh, I for isolation, and uh, D for durability, uh, which are properties that ensure that database uh, uh, it been a uh, transactions or uh, especially useful for in database transaction modes. So atomicity mostly uh, tells that whether we can execute all the transaction at once or none of the transaction. So uh, let's say suppose uh, we have a two transactions like uh, DML and uh, uh, DML one and DML two terms of a transaction. If after executing the DML one, if you are uh, you know SQL queries get fail uh, with uh, any of the uh, any of the reasons like you know. Uh, network issues, system crashes, OS crashes, and any other details. It do not. Uh, it will roll back the transaction that happened uh, as part of the DML one operation. So that is about the acid. Next thing, uh, atomicity. Next about the consistency. Means uh, whenever you move the data, whenever you do any changes to the database, it will move from one consistent state to the other consistent state. It do not relate to the inconsistency uh, behavior. Like. Uh, like at any point of the system, if you query the database, it will give you the single source, source of the information, single truth of the information. It do not give the multiple kind of information for uh, at any point of time. And next thing is uh, isolation. Isolation is nothing but if multiple transactions are executing uh, parallelly in a, in a database system, it can enforce that only one transaction can execute on, the one, on one time. So that is about the isolation. Next, we can have a durability. Durability is nothing but once the changes are applied to the database, once the transaction has completed, the changes are uh, permanent. Like uh, it cannot remove those changes. Uh, it cannot remove the uh, changes. So these properties will be handled. Uh, these are all the RDBMS properties. Is in a database will follow this. Uh, what is the difference between the head and the data methods in the Spark Data Frame API? Uh, yeah. Uh, head and uh, take are both uh, retrieve the data from the data frame or uh, RDDs and uh, these are the actions. So head can return the rows as a row object but take can return the array of uh, rows. Head is often used for a small preview while take is useful for working directly with uh, array data structures. Head is uh, uh, limited to local Spark session while take can operate on distributed uh, data set name. Could you design a process for injecting data into a fact table? Uh, so ingest the data into the fact table. Uh, I need to verify a few things before loading into the fact table. I can ensure that uh, data should have a standard quality 
as per we uh, defined. So what are the data quality check that we have defined? So the data has to pass all the data quality uh, check so that the data we can consider it as a high quality data. So then only we can load the data to the uh, fact table. And also we can check the freshness of the data. If it is a fresh data, we are going to insert the data into the CDC kind of a, uh, data or like uh, incremental data. Uh, we use mostly to load the data to the target table and also we will uh, we'll, uh, enforce to use the surrogate key for joining and index the uh, strategies optimized for uh, query for comments. Finally, I'll, co uh, I'll uh, implement a backup uh, mechanism for rollbacks or any enforce the uh, to roll back any changes or uh, at each step will maintain the accuracy of the fact table. So mostly I can uh, uh, check the data quality and also incremental data and uh, enforce to use the uh, surrogate keys and uh, uh, we can in, uh, we can implement the better uh, index strategies to uh, improve the query performance and also we implement the backup and uh, uh, disaster recording for the uh, fact table.